this, here's a, a comic which came out a couple of weeks ago. It's an XKCD comic. It turns out the 22nd of December this year is an event that astronomers have been looking forward to for a very, very long time. And why the hexagon, for people who are wondering? So this is about the James Webb Space Telescope, and the James Webb Space Telescope is made up of hexagonal segments to its mirror, so it actually has this rather beautiful kind of honeycomb appearance to it. This seems to be a project that the launch date has moved many times. It has, and in fact it recently moved, so it was the 18th until a couple of weeks ago. So JWST is now at the launch site in French Guiana. It's arrived. There's a whole rigmarole about that. They had to, you know, they kept very quiet about what ship it was being shipped in because they were nervous it was going to get held to ransom on the way and all sorts of things like that. But anyway, finally arrived and is being integrated onto the rocket at the ESA launch site down there in French Guiana. You want to launch them as close to the equator as you can to kind of get a nice kick from the Earth. And so there they are, quite close to the equator. But then while they were in the process of integrating it, a clamp unexpectedly released which basically didn't quite drop the telescope, but it jerked it uh, in a way that the telescope was not designed to be jerked, at which point everyone got very, very nervous and they stopped everything and they had a quick inquiry just to make sure that actually this wasn't going to happen again, but also to make sure nothing bad had happened to the telescope when it was jerked in this way. Turned out everything was fine, but that pushed things back another four days. So yeah, we went from the 18th to the 22nd. But as you said, this is the end of another of a, of a very long series of delays. In fact, I have another XKCD comic for you. This one was made in 2018, which is a nice plot showing the planned launch date as a function of when it was being planned. So way back in the 1990s, for example, when I first became aware of the telescope, we were planning to launch it in about 2007 or thereabouts. And you can see that as time has gone on, it's got steadily delayed. And the point of this comic back in 2018 was to point out that at least these lines were kind of converging with each other, because ultimately you want your launch date to be the current date. And at that point, they were projecting it would happen in about 2026. Turns out, hopefully, they were a bit pessimistic in that actually in 2018, they picked on 2021 and it's stayed at 2021 since then. So hopefully this line is now horizontal and we will reach this point where the current date and the launch date are the same date sometime just before Christmas this year. Professor, there's so much more nervousness about this launch than almost any space launch I can think of, certainly non-human ones. Can you help us understand why the stakes are so high here? Firstly, it's a very complicated thing. It's a very expensive thing and it's taken a very long time. If you put those three things together, people get extremely nervous about it. The long time thing, people have basically spent their entire careers working on this telescope. So actually, if it doesn't work, that's their life work down the tubes. So not surprisingly, that's kind of, you know, that makes people pretty nervous. And secondly, it's a really large sum of money. It's, you know, the total budget, obviously, as, as the thing's been delayed more and more, one of the things that always goes with delays is costs go up and up, and it's going to cost ultimately about $10 billion. So it's a serious, serious sum of money about it. And the final thing is that it's incredibly complicated. And when you make something that complicated, there are just a myriad ways it can go wrong. This is a, a blog post from NASA. So this is the official word from NASA. Relatively recently, this came out, it was talking about the launch of the telescope. And it says about 50 deployments need to occur. We're talking about the deployments, that's basically things moving when it's up there. So 50 movements need to occur after launch to set up the huge system with 344 so-called single point failures. So firstly, the deployments, the movements, I remember years and years ago, I showed an animation of JWST as it was deploying to a mate of mine who works in the satellite industry. And I could just see the color kind of draining out of his face as he was watching this thing. Because in order to pack the thing into the nose cone of a rocket, you have to fold it up. And so once it's up there, it has to unfold with incredible accuracy. And there's all these parts need to expand and come out and unfold correctly and clunk into place. And as each of these things was moving, I could see this guy kind of looking paler and paler. And he said to me, you know, in satellites, we hate moving parts because moving parts fail. And things which work perfectly well in a lab, you find when you put them into space, you know, things vacuum weld together and all sorts of weird things happen and they won't move. And so we design our satellites with as few moving parts as we can get away with. And look at all these number of moving parts you've got. And then there's this 344 single point failure. So basically these are things where if something goes wrong, we think we fixed it, you know, we think we've made it so it won't go wrong. But if something goes wrong in this one thing, then the thing won't work, right? And, and 344 is an awful lot of them. And they all have to not fail. That means that if for any one of them, if there's a one in a thousand chance that it goes wrong, so just, you know, we've really fixed it. If we've nailed it down, there's only a one in a thousand chance it'll go wrong. But of course, they all have to 
go, go that other, you know, 999 times out of a thousand, it'll be fine, but one time in a thousand, it won't. And so you have to multiply 0.999 by 0.999 by, you know, 344 times, which turns out to be about 0.7. So that means that even if each one of those, there's only a one in a thousand chance it'll go wrong, ultimately it means that there's only a 70% chance the telescope will work. Now, hopefully they've mitigated all these much more than a one in a thousand chance, but it shows you that actually, even if you think you've nailed, and that they're just the ones they know about, right? And so if there's other stuff that people haven't even thought of, you know, your unknown unknowns. So that's why people are keeping absolutely everything crossed at this point. A fourth thing that you didn't mention yeah. that make the stakes so high is that it's totally unfixable. Oh yes, so the Hubble Space Telescope, which is the kind of successor to, was really designed to work more in the optical and the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. This is really designed to work in the infrared, for reasons we'll come on to a little bit. One of the problems with doing infrared astronomy is that everything glows in the infrared, and in particular the Earth and the Moon glow very brightly in the infrared. So you want to get this telescope as far away as you can from the Earth, and in a way where you can actually shield it from the Earth, so it never actually looks at the Earth. You keep all the cold side of it away from the Earth to stop the Earth from warming it up. And that means you have to shoot it a long way from Earth. So it actually end up at one of these Lagrange point orbits. It's the L2 orbit. So it's about a million miles from the Earth, basically. It's far too far away for an astral ever to fix. I can understand that the people who've worked on this and made it their life work are feeling very nervous right now, like unspeakably nervous. But what about other astronomers like you? Does it give you cold sweats or are you just kind of watching it almost like a sports game? I wonder what, <laughs> what way is it going to go? I, I hope I have enough empathy from my colleagues that I'm actually, you know, I'm feeling for them, right? I, I, I should say I, I don't have much skin in this game. Right? I, I'm not planning to, it's, you know, it's really optimised for doing things that aren't the kind of astronomy I do for the most part. So actually, in that sense, I don't have a particular direct stake in it. But so much of my community does and we've invested so much in it that it will be completely devastating for the community if it doesn't work. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sweating almost as much as they are. Is part of you jealous that 10 billion was spent on instrumentation that doesn't advance your particular niche in the field? Or are you big enough to think it's for the greater good? To an extent, I'm, I'm happy to say it's for the greater good. There was, you know, there was a big argument in astronomy when we were first proposing this and its budget was growing and growing and growing. And actually in the US, it was growing to the extent that it was squeezing everything else out. Because of course, NASA only has a certain amount of money to spend on science. And as JWST's budget was growing and growing, that was pushing other things out. And I think there really was, you know, legitimate concern in the astronomical community at this point. They're saying, we're putting all our eggs in this one basket. We're committing to do this one thing and actually we're probably losing out on lots of smaller things we could be doing because there just isn't any money to do them anymore. But obviously that, you know, that's, that argument has been had and won, and so actually there's no point really in going back over that. And now we've got this, you know, and it truly is, it's a brilliant facility. We have this brilliant facility, we, and assuming that it works, we'll be doing some truly amazing science with it. Let's have a picture of it. Should we look at a picture of it? Always. Here's the telescope. Its primary mirror, this thing, is six and a half metres across which is too big to fit into the top end of an Ariane 5, so it's going up in an Ariane 5 launcher. That's one of the main contributions that the Europeans are making to this mission. It's made up of these hexagonal segments. The individual segments are made of beryllium, which is a really nasty material. Very poisonous. It, it's very toxic. Yeah, nasty stuff to work with. But it's very light, very rigid, and it doesn't care if you put it in very cold temperatures. So it's perfect for this. In some ways, it's not going to be as spectacular as a Hubble Space Telescope because it won't be seeing kind of the optical light that, that tends to make for very spectacular images of things. It's much more kind of red light all the way through to the infrared. And so the gold coating is basically because gold reflects very well all through that range of wavelengths from the red to the infrared. This here is about the size of a tennis court and is basically the thing that keeps the sun off. Because remember we said we have to keep this telescope cold in order for it to, to do its infrared astronomy. And the only way you can keep something cold is to stop it being in direct sunlight. And so throughout its entire lifetime, this sunshade, which again, obviously is enormous, so it had to unfurl, it's these very thin, series of very thin sheets, each of which kind of gets pulled out into this large diamond shaped structure. So when it's in orbit, the Earth will be somewhere down here, and actually the sun will be down here as well. So you keep the Earth out of the way, you keep the sun out of the way, you keep the moon out of the way. They're always behind this shade. And obviously then your solar array, so your solar panels are pointed that way because that's where the sun is, uh, and your communications stuff, so there's an antenna there. That's where the Earth is as well, so you're pointing your communications that way, but everything this side is kind of always in shade. So basically the light comes to the front, bounces up to the secondary mirror here, bounces through a hole in the middle, but it ends up in kind of the instruments which are at the back here, which are the things that kind of record the light. We can take spectra, we can make images. 
Uh, let me show you the optics. So this is kind of a sort of cross-sectional view. This is a three-mirror design, so you've got primary, secondary, tertiary. It turns out there are three kind of main forms of image distortion. With a three-mirror design to your telescope, you can kind of optimally take out all three of those effects. If you've only got two mirrors, you end up trading one thing off against another. So you might get rid of the coma, but you get more spherical aberration. But with three mirrors, you can actually design it to really optimise it. And the reason why you have this slightly weird off-axis design is so that off-axis actually introduces an aberration of its own. It messes up the images, but you, then you just have this tertiary mirror, which has just the right shape to take, it, take those effects back out again. And the nice thing is that you can have the light bouncing out here, back through there, off that tertiary mirror. If it were a, a beautifully symmetric design, that mirror would be kind of right in the middle here, and it would have blocked the light from coming in in the first place. But by kind of offsetting everything in this way, you can kind of get the mirrors out of line with each other so that the, they don't sort of all lie in each other's light path. This final fine mirror is actually just a flat mirror. And all it's there to do is that if the pointing of the telescope starts to wander a little bit, that kind of mirror just tilts a little bit to bring whatever you're looking at back to the middle. So it's just basically like image stabilisation, which is what that final mirror is doing. It just will, will correct things and, and hold your image sharply together. There are many science goals for these things, but one of them is you know, obviously to peer further than we've ever been able to peer before. And because of the finite light travel time, when you peer further, you're looking back in time. So by peering further than we've ever been peering before, we can look earlier and earlier in the universe. And so the hope is we'll be able to see things so far away that we'll actually see the first stars forming in the universe. That's a very challenging thing to do because, you know, individual stars are incredibly faint. And we want to look at an individual star, you know, billions of light years away. The thing that kind of works in our favour a little bit is it's thought in the primordial universe all there was was hydrogen and helium, the stuff that was made in the Big Bang, a little bit of lithium, but basically just hydrogen and helium, no heavy elements. And when you go and solve those stellar structure equations that tell you all about how stars are made up, what stars are stable, what stars will form, if you try and make stars with no heavy elements in them, it looks like you end up with very massive stars, and very massive stars are very bright. And so that's why we think we have stand a good shot of actually seeing those, that first generation of stars form because we think those first generation of stars were very massive and very bright. And so with the James Webb, we will have enough sensitivity to pick up the individual stars that formed. Now, the other thing we have to fight against is those stars will be probably producing most of their light kind of in the optical part of the spectrum, ultraviolet part of the spectrum. But as that light's traveled to us, the universe has been expanding, so that light gets stretched out. So that optical and ultraviolet light that was emitted there will be in the infrared by the time it gets to the JWST. And that's why the JWST is optimised to work in the infrared, because that's where we'll actually be able to see these very distant objects in the universe. I know all telescopes look back in time, but it's never felt so much like we're looking back in time as with this. This really is, you know, it's not to the beginning, right? And, you know, the, the cosmic microwave background in, uh, satellites and telescopes, they really are looking back almost as far as we can hope to see. But this is getting there, right? This is really looking well beyond where we've been, been able to see today. To see, as I say, see the first stars, see the first galaxies, so the first collections of those stars starting to come together to form galaxies as well. That seems like a very specialised use, though. Will it have, like, if that, that's the primary goal, will it have other uses? Can other astronomers... Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, could you point it at just a nearby galaxy? You could point it at a planet. Infrared tends to be associated with cooler things, right? And so, for example, if you could use it to look at a planetary disk forming around a, a star. And of course, because the other thing you gain when you've got a big telescope is not only do you collect more light so you can see faint things, but you make sharper images too. Because the sharpness of the images, you know, kind of increases as you make a telescope twice as big, the images get twice as sharp. This is a telescope that's, what, almost three times as big as the Hubble Space Telescope. So actually we'll get images which are almost three times as sharp. And so actually we'll be able to see planets around other stars, see planetary systems forming see the individual planets and actually collect enough light to split up the light that's reflected from those individual planets to study the properties of their atmospheres. So we'll actually be able to learn something about the planets that are orbiting around other stars, not just as what the planet there, not just image it, but actually start looking at the properties of what light gets reflected from that planet, which tells us what its atmosphere is made of. If it gets off the launch pad, please let it get off the launch pad. <laughs> How long will we know until it's, if it's unfolded correctly and like, is it a long, long way? I think it's a matter of weeks to really get it to that point, yeah, where we'll know everything. I mean, I, you know, it's one of those things, there are many places it can fail. Some of them will be, you know, before it gets off the launch pad. Some of them will be at separation for stages where it's coming away from the, from, you know, as the rocket stages burn up and so on. Some of it will be as it's getting to that L2 point, getting it into the right orbit. Some of it will be as it deploys once it's there. You know, there are lots of places where people are going to be holding their breath, I think. Background hum. 
So this is Miri, the mid-infrared instrument. Uh, this is the final flight build. This is the one that's going to go out to NASA, get integrated to the spacecraft and be launched in about four years' time. Thank <laughs> you.